Hey everybody, it's James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast, and it's time to talk some more about queer theory. Uh, I want to make the case, and I suppose there's about a billion ways I could do this, I want to make the case that queer theory is the doctrine of a sex-based cult. That's it. Uh, in other words, to put it more frankly, or more clearly, I suppose, um, queer theory, which pretends to be an academic discipline, is the uh, the doctrine of a religious cult that primarily targets children and that is based on sex and topics related to sex, and that's sex meant in both meanings of the word, both uh, the biological fact and the activity, uh, which is related to the biological fact, incidentally. And it uh, has very little to do with gay identity. So those are the main points of contention. Some of you will recognize, if you're readers as well, that what I'm going to do in this episode is actually summarize um, or mostly run through and ad lib off of a essay that I published on New Discourses in February after I gave this as a talk in Pittsburgh at the University of Pittsburgh, which is the one where people dressed as clowns came to protest me. And if you remember that image on the website, you know what I'm talking about. It was an amusing little story. The clowns were outside. I didn't see them. Then the clowns came in. I did see them. And uh, there was one clown actually and her friend. And about five minutes into the talk, about the after about the time I'd given like the basic introduction and some serious facts, she started crying, got up and left and called her mom so loudly that you could hear her kind of blubber um, into the phone. Hey, mom, as she walked out and no further incidents were recorded. But um, the way I started off was as strongly as possible by saying exactly what I just said. I'm here to talk about queer theory and its major points can be summarized very easily. Queer theory is the doctrine of a religious cult. That religious cult is based on sex. That's not the same as saying a sex cult, by the way. That's actually different. It is based on sex in both regards, but it's not necessarily a uh, sex as an activity oriented uh, cult. And that sex based religious cult primarily targets children, and almost none of it has anything to do with gay people or gay identity. And all of that is actually demonstrable in their literature. Um, the least obvious of these points is that last point that has nothing to do with gay people, and it's a great place to start. And the way I make this case, I could point to an awful lot of their academic literature, uh, Drag Queen Story Hour, which I read their academic paper about drag pedagogy um, in, one of the, in the Groomer School series. I think it was Groomer Schools 4. I read the, that paper. Talks about how the point of Drag Queen Story Hour is not actually for LGBT empathy. It's not even about LGBT identity. It's about awakening a queer potential, queer horizon, living queerly, alternate modes of kinship, blah, blah, blah. In other words, what queer theory is doing is hiding behind gay identities and it doesn't even have much to do with them. The gold standard proof in their literature comes from David Halperin, which is, uh, uh, he's a scholar who is the one who defined queer in queer theory in his book from 1995 called Saint Foucault Toward a Gay Hagiography, which means toward making him into a saint. Now, Saint Foucault refers to Michel Foucault, People have heard me say Saint Foucault referencing the book, particularly I did it at Oxford in my debate, and they thought I was making a joke. No, it's literally the title of the friggin' book. Um, and you can actually go look at this book and read how horrifying it is. It's impossible, actually, on anything that you want to publish, you know, FCC guidelines or even the much looser online guidelines to read this book to you um, because it's too blatantly inappropriate. I mean, it occasionally talks about topics like, um, I don't even want to say it because I don't want the video to get demonetized. Uh, <laughs> let's just say that it refers to putting fists in certain orifices very explicitly and refers to it as a liberatory practice and um, calls it anal yoga uh, explicitly. I mean, you can get the book and search the term anal yoga and you're going to find all of this right there in the book. Uh it's pretty shocking to read, like a lot of queer theory. But David Halperin's book is kind of the gold standard for defining the word queer. It's where the word queer was first defined. It's like the first major treatise that lays out queer theory as queer theory and what it's a, a, aiming to accomplish. Obviously, given the title, it's building off of the ideas of Michel Foucault, who is this 
French postmodernist. He was also a pedophile. He was also a BDSM gay man. He bragged about his experiences in bathhouses in San Francisco and elsewhere. There are some very unfortunate stories regarding male children or boys around 11, 12, 13 in Tunisia that have come out. At any rate, that's who he's hearkening back to. And what he's really pushing back to, he could get into discipline and punish, birth of the clinic, uh, civilization and madness, some of uh, Foucault's kind of groundbreaking, I guess, if you want work in what we would recognize now as critical constructivism. But uh, in this case, it's mostly the history of sexuality and primarily history of sexuality, volume one. And Foucault in that book is laying out what is the idea of a homosexual in a very kind of parallel way to what Simone de Beauvoir was doing, laying out the concept of what is a woman in the second sex in 1949. Uh, although allegedly Foucault was not copying Beauvoir, I don't know if that's the case or not. I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to try to parse it out today. What I am going to say, though, is that it's the same idea, is that the homosexual should be defining himself on his own terms, and those terms have to be defiant to the heterosexual, homosexual binary uh, and the power constructions built around it. And this idea of an oppositionally defiant identity, political identity, against norms and expectations is what Halperin said means queer. And in fact, he says that it means queer, um, where help, where um, Foucault says the homosexual, it can only be interpreted to mean queer. Uh, I probably have that citation somewhere and could pull it up to read it to you, but it's, uh, I didn't plan to, I don't think I put it in this essay, but it's an eye opener. Um, but I'm going to read some from St. Foucault as it is, uh, just so that you can have a sense that this is not about gay identity. So the first words of this relevant definition appear on page 62 that's the page in this book. You have to read 61 pages of Jesus Christ. Could you just shut you weirdos before you get to the point where he defines queer? And here's how that paragraph starts. The first three words, which are by the by a you know typesetting quirk, are in bold all caps, uh, are unlike gay identity. So when he sets out to define queer, the first thing he says is it is unlike gay identity. It's something different than gay. Queer is not the same as gay. This is why he had to do his whole exploration about the homosexual um, from Foucault, because it's something different. So what he explains the difference is, is that gay identities, as Halpern puts it, are grounded in a positive fact. That means something about reality. They are grounded in the positive fact of homosexuality. Now, Halpern does not actually say that gay is something that is intrinsic and essential to the person as an accident of birth, because he says that it's grounded in the positive fact of homosexual object choice. That's his actual phrase, which means that it might be the choosing of same-sex desire. He doesn't go so far as to say it's innate, but he does say that it's real, the positive fact of homosexuality. Queer, he is contrasting to that, and he says explicitly that it need not be based on any positive truth or in any stable reality at all, and he says there is nothing in particular to which it, to which it refers. Queer doesn't mean anything in particular, is what he's saying. He calls it an identity without an essence. That means, unlike gay identities, it is not based in reality. So what is queer if it is not based in reality? It is a radical political view. In fact, if we want to pull from the Antonio Gramsci ideas of cultural Marxism, it is a counter-hegemonic idea. There's this idea that we have prevailing cultural values and they tend to maintain themselves and transmit themselves and stabilize people and themselves, and that's cultural hegemony. It's quote-unquote the way things are. And queer is a defiant oppositional position against that. In other words, it's 
counter-hegemonic. Just like Antonio Gramsci said, the point of what we now call cultural Marxism or Western Marxism is to establish counter-hegemonic infiltration into our institutions. So bringing queer theory into institutions, whether education, law, whatever it happens to be, media, doesn't matter, bringing queer theory into institutions is a counter-hegemonic activity in line with Gramsci's Western Marxism which we often call cultural Marxism. Halperin tells us that queer means adopting a politics that is against whatever the normal, the legitimate, and the dominant are. And so you can tell I'm not just making it up. Here's exactly how he phrases it. Unlike gay identity, which, though deliberately proclaimed in an act of affirmation, is nonetheless rooted in the positive fact of homosexual object choice, Queer identity need not be grounded in any positive truth or in any stable reality. As the very word implies, queer does not name some natural kind or refer to some determinate object. See, it's not real. It acquires its meaning from its oppositional relation to the norm. Queer is, by definition, whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. There is nothing in particular to which it necessarily refers. It is an identity without an essence. Now, I'm cutting off here a lot of how actually psychotic David Halperin is um, when I present it this way. Uh, I have the book open, so I'll just read to you a little bit more. He says, queer then demarcates not a positivity, that means something real, but a positionality, that means a politics, vis-a-vis the normative, a position, and here's where it gets weird. They can't leave it alone. A positionality that is not restricted to lesbians and gay men, so it's not really about being gay, but is in fact available to anyone who is or feels marginalized. You don't even have to be marginalized. You just have to feel marginalized because of her or his sexual practices. It could include some married couples without children, for example, or even who knows some married couples with children, with perhaps very naughty children. I'm just going to pause. What the hell is he, what's he talking about? I'll let you speculate. What the hell is he talking about? Why does he say that it could be couples who are married with very naughty children? Very naughty is in italics. What does he mean here? Why do they always go there? But I'll continue the rest of the page. Queer, he says, in any case, does not designate a class of already objectified pathologies or perversions. So it's not just about that. Rather, it describes a horizon of possibility, just like communism is a horizon of possibility for socialist praxis. It describes a horizon of possibility whose precise extent and heterogeneous scope cannot in principle be delimited in advance. It is queer Marxism, in other words. It is from the eccentric positionality occupied by the queer subject. So it's subjective. It's not real. That it may become possible to envision a variety of possibilities for reordering the relations among sexual behaviors, erotic identities, constructions of gender, forms of knowledge, regimes of enunciation, logics of representation, modes of self-constitution, and practices of community for restructuring, that is, the relations among power, truth, and, of all things he could pick, desire. This is why in the Drag Queen Story Hour paper, it says explicitly that Drag Queen Story Hour or queer world-making is, I think, what it actually says. Queer world-making is always a project rooted in desire. He underscores his point, though, that it's not about gay identities by saying that it's not restricted to lesbians and gay men, but in fact that it's open to anyone who is or feels marginalized because of his or her sexual practices. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with something that doesn't have a lot to do with gay identity at all when we're talking about queer and thus queer theory. And we're talking about something that is rooted in sex because of his or her sexual practices. It's right there in the text. It's extremely clear. But what is, what is the conclusion that we draw from this discussion? 
that Halpern gives us, the defining characteristic of queer in queer theory, it is that you cannot be queer. Do you understand me? There's no such thing as a queer identity. There is, let me say it again, no such thing as a queer identity. You can only do queerness. You can only act queer, and that's what it is. It's an act. And that's why with Judith Butler's work, we see that her work could kind of boil down to drag is life and life is drag, and that the enlightened people are the people who know we're always doing a drag performance. What do I mean by that? If I'm a man and I present as a man and look like a man and act like a man and am a man, I'm just doing male drag as a man. And if I'm a woman and I'm doing female drag, or I'm sorry, if I'm a woman and I present myself as a woman and live accor- you know, according to feminine uh, choices and stereotypes and activities and so on, I'm just doing female drag. And if I'm a male who does female drag, I'm still just doing drag, but now I've chosen to do it. I'm not just doing it like a socialized robot. I'm awake and I've chosen to do that in a defiance of the norm. So nobody is queer. People feel queer against some standard. In other words, they feel defiantly opposed. And I keep using this language, by the way, oppositional defiant. Oppositional defiant. Why? Because there's a disorder known as oppositional defiant disorder, which seems to fit the bill here. They are people who feel and act against the norm and against legitimacy on purpose. So they are not queer. They are acting queerly. And that means they are acting defiantly against normalcy and legitimacy while denying and even decrying reality. You can only perform queerness. That's what Judith Butler's work is really about, gender performativity. You can only perform queerness, but they think everything is a form of queerness. You just don't know. You're either upholding the status quo or you're you're rejecting it. So you can only perform queerness, or if you refuse their liberatory politics as they see them, you can perform straightness instead. Performing straightness to queer theory isn't being who you are if you're straight, just like gender performance. It's just another kind of performance, one that upholds the allegedly oppressive status quo instead of opposing it, which is thus problematic. We see the same theme in the Drag Queen Story Hour paper, from a couple of years ago. Let me see if I actually found the, this other quote from uh, from Foucault, just to kind of really drive in the point. I know that I have it in this other document. Yeah, he says, this is Halperin talking about Foucault, with the homosexual. He says, Foucault insisted that homosexuality did not name an already existing form of desire, but was rather something to be desired. So it doesn't f- describe a way of being romantically or sexually attracted to people. It's something that you want to become. It's an identity you seek to become. He says, our task is therefore to become homosexual. That's quoting from Foucault. Not to persist in acknowledging that we are homosexual. Or to put it more precisely, what Foucault meant is that our task is to become queer. For his remarks make sense only if he understood the term homosexual according to my definition of queer. Remember, we're reading David Halperin here. As an identity without an essence, not a given condition, but a horizon of possibility, an opportunity for self-transformation, a queer potential. Because one can't become homosexual, strictly speaking. Either one is or one isn't. But one can, listen to this shit, one can marginalize oneself, one can transform oneself, one can become queer. Indeed, queer marks the very sight of gay becoming. So that is what Halperin is saying is the point of queer theory. And that's what meshes with the Drag Queen Story Hour paper that I was about to jump to. So I just want to remind you that in that paper, there's a section near the end titled From Empathy to Embodied Kinship. It makes the same point we just made. That section makes the point that queer programs are presented as improving LGBT empathy, in their words, and that Drag Queen Story Hour makes use of such tropes, again, their word. It then says that that's not really what Drag Queen Story Hour is about at all. It says that's not what queer education or queer world-making are about either. 
Instead, they use the so-called tropes of empathy strategically, that's their word, as a marketing platform, that's their word too, to justify getting it into schools, libraries, and in front of kids. But it's actually not about empathy at all. It's about leading the kids to see the world in themselves in a queer way. In other words, to lead them into a queer worldview. Worldviews, by the way, have ideologies. The ideology of the queer worldview is queer theory. So it is the doctrine of a sex-based cult that primarily targets children should add through manipulation and deception, and that has very little to do with gay people. Here's how it's worded in the Drag Queen Story Hour paper in the relevant part. Finally, they say, it is often assumed that's Lil Miss Hot Mess and Harper Keenan, a drag queen at Arizona State University, whose real name is Harris Kornstein, and uh, Harper Keenan is a trans education researcher um, somewhere. I don't know. Maybe Canada. Finally, they say, it is often assumed that the primary pedagogical tool of queer education should be to increase empathy toward LGBT people. That's what you've heard. That's why we're supposed to have Drag Queen Story Hour, because we have to care about the poor little gay kids who don't have representation and apparently need a drag queen to look at to feel represented. They go on to say, while this premise has some merit and it underlies many sincere projects in educational and cultural work, including Drag Queen Story Hour, the notion of empathy has also been critiqued by feminist scholars of color and others for the ways in which, notice they throw that intersectional kitchen sink. This is about drag queens, but it's been critiqued by feminist scholars of color and others for the ways in which empathy can enable an effective, it's emotional effective, a effective with an A, not an E, an affective appropriation of an individual's unique experiences and reinforce hierarchies of power. That's a lot. But what they're saying is that when you can start, basically that you can do uh, Munchausen's by proxy, you can start to show empathy in order to elevate yourself and thus cause problems for the people you're allegedly empathetic toward. Whether through literature or virtual reality, these tropes tend to reflect an overstated ability to understand difference as well as empathy's potential to preclude meaningful relationships of solidarity. See, you can't be in solidarity with somebody you feel sorry for. They go on and say, It is undeniable that Drag Queen Story Hour participates in many of these tropes of empathy from the marketing language the program uses to its selection of books. And here it is. Much of this is done strategically in order to justify its educational value. However, we suggest that drag supports uh, scholars' critiques of empathy rather than reifying the concept. Reifying in the sense of George Lukács, one of the other founders or fathers of cultural Marxism, to means to make real through social uh, processes. This approach can, they, this is them again, this approach can support students in finding the unique or queer aspects of themselves rather than attempting to understand what it is like to be LGBT. So what they're telling you is that the point is grooming people into a queer ideological worldview, children in particular, not about increasing empathy. It's not about understanding... Duh, obviously. They aren't putting a drag queen in front of the kids because it's trying to teach kids what it's like to be gay. Drag queens are a horrific like misrepresentation of that phenomenon. It's to support students in finding the unique or queer aspects of themselves. That's what it's really about. It, drag Queen Story Hour is not about empathy. That's their marketing strategy. And it is, in fact, to their eyes, a bit problematic. So they know that they're lying about it in a way that actually goes against their values in order to get it into the schools and libraries and in front of children in general. But what it's really about is getting kids to discover any aspects of themselves that they might feel uncomfortable about or marginalized because of or different because of that might be able to be considered queer by a queer theorist or queer educator so that those aspects can be nurtured in the sense of making them have more and more and more discomfort about themselves and then until a, a, an initiatory rupture occurs so that they can develop the children into a queer, a queer political stance 
that will then be conflated with being who they really are. That's what's going on with queer theory. That's what Halpern is actually describing. By calling them queer identities, what you're doing is saying, here's this political activity, and you're going to pretend that that political activity is who you are. By the way, that political activity is hating the world as it is and hating people for being normal and hating um, anything that is, is based in the idea of legitimacy, so oppositional defiant disorder, as a political stance that you're now going to consider to be who you are, which is in fact in the definition of queer, not what it's about. So what will happen is they take these kids, they introduce them to queer potentialities by sticking a drag queen in front of them, and then they make them feel uncomfortable about themselves and they exploit that uncomfortable or emotional crisis or whatever it is to make them feel isolated and alone. And then they say, there's a new way to understand yourself and there's a new way to understand who you are and the world and why it doesn't like you. So then they can awaken to some basic ideas of queer theory and more than that, they'll be told that they're not truly allowed to be who they really are. Society will object. Their parents will object. In particular, they'll focus on the objection to the parents because they have to get the kids away from their parents whose parental duty and responsibility it is to protect them from this kind of ideological and maybe worse grooming. In fact, it's so likely that their parents will reject this, this discovery of who they really are as queer that it may have to be kept secret from their parents in case it wouldn't be affirmed by them. And don't worry, the state, depending on what state you're in, and now more than a dozen states, will force your parents to affirm this or threaten to take your children away or maybe take them away for real. I'm not supposed to use, I know, the word grooming to describe this grotesque set of activities. That's a part of a major controversy. In fact, it's part of it's one of the main reasons that these kids came dressed as clowns to protest me at Pitt when I gave this talk. Um, but I'm not supposed to call these people groomers because it makes the left mad that we call them what they are. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question instead. Instead of saying, this is obviously groomer, groomer behavior, and I know I already did, let's back up, let's slow down, let's be a little more careful, Jim. Ugh. I'm going to show you something else from this paper, and I'm going to ask this question. What word am I supposed to use for it? We've already talked about this idea of from empathy to embodied kinship. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to read something else from this paper, and I want to know what word I am supposed to use for it. Drag Queen Story Hour presents itself as family-friendly in a way that characterizes itself as a preparatory introduction to alternate modes of kinship. That's what it says. What does that mean? What does that mean? Preparatory introduction to alternate modes of kinship. In fact, it says the family and family-friendly refers to a queer code for the other queers they connect with on the street rather than the family that's like the real family. So the Drag Queen Story Hour people are not just lying about the idea that they use empathy, but they're also lying about what they mean by family when they sell it as family-friendly. They tell us themselves in black and white that they mean it is a queer code for a new family, a queer family, a drag family, that Drag Queen Story Hour is teaching kids to become friendly to. That's what they mean by family-friendly, but they want you to think it means that, yeah, adults and parents and little kids and their grandparents are all welcome to come watch. The paper, in fact, repeatedly invokes the concept of a drag family for the kids that they would, you know, obviously latch on to in order to develop their queer aspects of themselves. And then the last sentence of the paper, the last half of that sentence anyway, is we'll leave a trail of glitter that will never come out of the carpet. Well, what's the carpet here? Seems like it's probably children's minds. Doesn't seem like that's on the up and up. Now remember, I'm going to read the actual full quote. I've just talked about it. Let me read the real quote to you, the real paragraph. And the question is, what word am I supposed to use for this? Because I'm not supposed to call it grooming. Okay. So here's a full, the full quote of that family friendly part. So you don't think I'm lying, even though I did a podcast about it before. Queer world making, including political organizing has long been a project driven by desire. That's what I said earlier. It is in part enacted through art. Sorry, it enacted through art forms like fashion, theater, and drag. So queer world making is enacted through art forms like fashion, theater, and drag. Notice it's not math or physics or history. 
We believe that Drag Queen Story Hour offers an invitation toward deeper public engagement with queer cultural production, particularly for young children and their families. This is one of those times where I want to have like digital slowdown, particularly for young children and their families, particularly particularly for young children. Do you get the point? Particularly for young children. It may be that Drag Queen Story Hour is, quote, family-friendly in the sense that it is accessible and inviting to families with children. That's what we call the mot. But it is less a sanitizing force than it is a preparatory introduction to alternate modes of kinship. Period. That's the Bailey. Here, Drag Queen Story Hour is, quote, family friendly in the sense of quote family as an old school queer code to identify and connect with other queers on the street so i'm asking i can't use the word groomer what word am i supposed to use for that i know which word i can't use and that puts me at a complete loss but what i have actually described to you isn't just drag queen story hour It is queer pedagogy. It is queer education. It is the installing of queer theory into children by means of the educational system and educational methodologies, both in terms of curriculum and in terms of teaching methods. So here's how queer theory works. You can't describe it. You can't say anything about it unless you support it, because otherwise you are applying power to it, you were being unjust, you were doing anti-LGBTQ hate, you didn't engage properly, because if you engaged properly, that means that you took on the worldview and agreed with it. You can't even talk about queer theory, according to queer theorists, unless you support it. It is just like a cult, one that targets kids, as we can clearly see, one that is based in sex, and one that doesn't have a lot to do with gay people. Remember, if you criticize queer theory, that's anti-LGBTQ hate. You will end up with a profile, if you're a high enough profile individual, such as myself, on the Southern Poverty Law Center accusing you of anti-LGBTQ hate, of hate speech, of malice, of all these things. You'll get accused of homophobia, transphobia, and the famous term is anti-LGBTQ hate. I'm going to keep coming back to that because there's so many things out there claiming that people such as me and others engage in anti-LGBTQ hate. All you have to do to engage in anti-LGBTQ hate is read queer theory out loud, word for word, as it is written by queer theorists themselves, and say, that's bad. So there's a rumor widely printed about me that I, because of my use of the word groomer to describe what we just talked about, implicates me in some social crime called anti-LGBTQ hate, which is apparently very bad, very serious, and utterly toxic, even though all it means is not agreeing with queer theory. It's not just harmful rhetoric, it's in fact also a conspiracy theory, they say, and I am a, not just a very bad person, which obviously I must be, but also a very crazy person for naming the obvious. Not as a result of inference, not as a result of guesswork, not as a result of any emotions that I have, but literally just by reading out loud and saying exactly what their own proudly printed writings say. Without any need to embellish, without any need to interpret, I just tell you what it says and say, by the way, they mean it. When they say that empathy is a marketing trope and that family-friendly is a marketing trope, but they really mean something else, that there is a Mott and Bailey uh, rhetorical strategy in play here, a Mott and Bailey actual dialectical lie here, all I'm doing is, is telling you what they've written, making taking some of the veneer off of it, and now I am a conspiracy theorist, I am a hater, I have a Southern Poverty Law Center um, article and uh, profile written up about me. And you think, well, who cares? That's like a badge of honor. And I take it that way, obviously. That's why I called myself General Hate. But stop for two seconds and realize that if I get called to do some professional thing, that's going to get brought up as a reason why I'm not supposed to be there. If I try to give a talk and protesters try to get it shut down, they're going to leverage that against some wavering or even complicit institutional administration to keep me out. 
they know how this works. The accusation and the resulting social dynamic, which is always hostile, is straight out of Maoism. It's straight out of Mao's China from the 1950s and 60s. I have been alleged to be engaging in a crime called anti-LGBTQ hate, and uh, the right side of history and right side of society, which are on the right side of history, are called to judge me, bully me, hold me to account for that crime by whatever means it can manage. The bullying is to continue until I learn to recognize my crime from the queer position. In other words, I adopt the positionality of queer theory and see how what I said or what I did was actually socially criminal, and I pledge to reform my thought by adopting queer theory so that I can not only do better but also become an activist on behalf of queer theory. It's a lifelong commitment to self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism. This is identical to the thought reform programs of Mao's China. It's just a slightly different ideology. Of course, their accusation is absolute nonsense, but that's not the point. The point is to in initiate the social struggle session on me in order to transform my views to ones that are either at least sympathetic to or ideally that embrace and repeat queer theory. The accusation is of an old Marxist standard form, truth married to a lie. And here's the truth. Gays and lesbians fought for decades to break the public perception that they are predators and groomers of children. But here's the lie. That's who and what I'm talking about when I criticize their theory and activism. In other words, I'm not talking about gay people. Just like Halperin's not talking about gay people, unlike gay identity, I'm talking about people who are deliberately engaging in the ideological and maybe worse uh, transformation of children into a queer political identity. That's who I'm talking about. But the, the, the lie is that I'm talking about gays and lesbians, or maybe trans people at large, when I criticize their own theory and activism and point out that what they say in their own words needs a word that sound, seems very groomery, even if I can't say groomer about it, and we're all not supposed to. Of course, we can say that, and we do say that, and it's not hate to point it out. It's right there in black and white. But this has nothing to do with any of that. The truth is that queer used to be a slur for gay people, so the activists took it on to describe themselves in defiance, of prejudice and bigotry, but also because it now becomes impossible to talk about it. Oh, queer theory, you're using a slur. There's there's a there's a situation. The lie is that queer theory ever represented civil rights movements for anyone or gay people in particular. In fact, it was the opposite. It was against everything that the gay civil rights movement was about. Queer theory is a destructive form of radical activism because it's a Marxist theory, so there has to be activism connected. It's not just a theory, it's theory and practice combined. And it is a destructive form of radical activism that actually historically opposed gay civil rights inequality. Well, why in the world would it do that? Aren't they the same thing? No, of course not, because gay equality and gay acceptance would normalize being gay within society and would legitimize normalcy and legitimacy, right? Legitimize gay people as fully equal members of society. Queer theory is by definition radically opposed on principle to anything normal and legitimate. They even have a word for what would happen if we had gay equality and gay acceptance. Homonormativity, which is society accepting gay as being part of the normal expression of what it means to be human sometimes. And that would mean it's within the normative framework now, and the gay people are expected to, okay, you're great, you're gay, so what? Great, get a, put on a suit and get a job. And that would all be very bad because they're no longer radical activists. Gay activists who are listening to this from the 1990s can readily back me up on this. They'll readily attest that the queer activists were often strongly opposed to their ambitions for civil and legal equality, for uh, marriage, and for social acceptance. They just were. Why? Because they wanted radicals. Queer theory needs radical activists, not stable citizens who can go about their lives in a society that doesn't in any way meaningfully discriminate against them. They need there to be discrimination or the appearance of hate or the, the fear that there will be the bad old times coming back in order to radicalize those people into revolutionary activity or just to show up and be human shields for the queer theorists who are doing that. The civil rights activists and the gay civil rights movements in the 80s, 90s, and so on fought hard for decades, to over, starting at least in the 50s, to overcome stereotypes of predatory behavior and the idea that they're intrinsically groomers. And that's why the queer theorists actually claim 
that, or that's why they're actually able to claim that calling out their blatant grooming is anti-LGBT, LGBTQ. They're saying, look, 50, 60 years ago, 30 years ago, people said that all gay, gay people are groomers and gay rights just enables groomers. And the gays fought, the gay civil rights leaders fought back and said, no, that is not what we're about. That is nothing to do with who we are. That is a harmful stereotype. And they won. We trusted them. And now you have these freaks and weirdos who are queer theorists who were never particularly interested in civil rights at all, who are saying, if you call them, which is the narrower, narrower subset, the Q, not even all the rest of it, if you call the Q groomers, then what you are doing is anti-LGBTQ hate. Do you see how the acronym works to create human shields? Do you understand that L lesbian, G, gay, B, bisexual, T, trans, Q, queer, all different, all different. Lesbians are women who are attracted to women. By the way, you have to know what a woman is to make that work. Gays are men who are attracted to men. You have to know what men are to make that work. Bisexuals are people who are attracted to men and women, bi, two. So you have to ex believe in the binary to make that work. Trans people, it's its own complicated topic, but they are men or women who do not recognize themselves as man or woman, and in fact may actually recognize themselves as the opposite. So something's very different there. And then Q is queer. And we already heard that queer has nothing to do with any of that because queer is a radical political stance. But if you criticize queer, you get wrapped up in anti-LGBTQ hate when you're not engaging in any anti-LG, B, or maybe even sometimes T, activity, thought, or anything at all. It's super fake. It's a standard trick that um, these kind of Gnostic cults do. Um, another example is the, the Christian nationalist movement it does the exact same trick. For example, if you criticize Christian nationalism and you happen not to be a Christian, ask me how I know, what they will say is, James is attacking Christians. No, I'm not. I'm attacking lunatics who are hiding behind the Christian identity and brand. Same thing with feminists. If you do, maybe ask me how I know again, maybe you call radical feminists hags. I don't know why you would do that. You'd say they're a bunch of man-hating hags. Maybe you would say that about radical feminists for some reason or another. Maybe nobody could know why you would say that, but maybe you say that. Maybe you're tempted to say that. And you say that, and they'll say, you're attacking women. No, you're not attacking women. You're talk you're attacking radical feminist hags. It's very clear who you're actually talking about, and they don't get to represent all women. It's very much like when Donald Trump, this is one of my favorite Donald Trump incidents, was in an interview with one of these hags, probably Katie Couric or something like that. I don't remember the details, but he was in this interview and they said, Well, what about when you called women hags? And luckily he knew what the hell they were no, pigs. What about when you called women pigs? And uh, Donald Trump luckily knew what the hell they were talking about. He said, I didn't call women pigs. I called Rosie O'Donnell a pig, which is hilarious because that's actually what's happening. And of course, I'm, I'm way off script here, but this is generally what they do. They blend contexts that are not the same together and treat them as though they're the same. Radical feminists might be women, but they are not representative of all women, no matter how much they think that they get to be the Gnostic representatives of true womanhood. They don't get to do that. So if you criticize the specific group, say radical feminists or Christian nationalists or queer theorists or whatever, they hide behind the general group by claiming to be the true representatives of that thing. They're blending together the context of the specific, their group, with the general or the whole, which they actually are a part of. Yes, it's true. When I criticize um, radical feminists who happen to be women, that I am cr criticizing some women, but I'm not criticizing women. As I, I don't even like to think of women as a class. I'm criticizing particular women just like Rosie O'Donnell. When I criticize L uh, queer theorists, I'm not criticizing LGBTQ because LGBTQ doesn't even exist. That's, that's a f manufactured synthetic coalition so that queer theorists can hide behind other people who are sympathetic characters. When I criticize Christian nationalists, it doesn't really matter. They call themselves Christian, but they're obviously not. So whatever. 
What's happening is that the fact is that queer activism, explicitly as we've described it so far, puts the appearance of glaring truth back into the stereotypes of groomers. And then when you call them out for it, they get mad and hide behind gay people and say, see, they're attacking you, all you gay people. See, the conservatives, everybody, the society hates gay people. And everyday gay people who are good citizens lose the most from this little trick because eventually things start to break down. And the queer activists gain the most because they end up with a larger pool of radicalism. They end up with more contention and division in society, and they end up with more instability in society. Queer activism is therefore a strictly parasitic behavior, like any cult activity. But about grooming more specifically, I am talking not even necessarily about the thing that they uh, are accusing me of. I'm not. When I say that, anti, that, that this is grooming, I'm not actually talking about the sexual grooming that they try to pretend. This is them, again, blending context. I am grooming, talking about grooming specifically into a cult ideology called queer theory. I've been very clear about this over and over again. You can look the word up, type in the word grooming and see what it means. Yes, there is the idea of sexual grooming and Oh, there it is. Ideological or political or whatever other professional grooming. But just to really drive home that they are doing ideological grooming like it's not already clear, let's direct our attention to another scholar, another queer educator, Kevin Kamishiro, who wrote a paper in 2002 called Against Repetition. And I remind you, against repetition means against the repetition of the existing society by teaching kids to be queer activists. Anyway, in that paper, he describes the purpose of queer education for children, and Kumashiro explicitly says that teaching children about social justice, including about ideas from queer theory, is meant to induce, in fact, it is the obligation of the teacher to do this, to induce an emotional and identity-based crisis in them. He then says that's why it's so important to have queer educators in place who can guide the, no, the now vulnerable students who are experiencing emotional crisis so that those crises are resolved in favor of social justice and queer theory. Here are some relevant quotes from the paper from pages 74 and 75. He says, repeating what is already learned can be comforting and therefore desirable students learning things that question their knowledge and identities on the other hand, can be emotionally upsetting. For example, suppose students think society is meritocratic, but learn that it is racist. Raise your hand if you're sick of this shit. Or think that they themselves are not contributing to homophobia, but learn that they, in fact, are. Raise your hand if you're sick of this shit. In such situations, students learn that the ways that they think and act are not only limited, but also oppressive. Learning about oppression and about the ways they often unknowingly comply with oppression can lead students to feel paralyzed with anger, sadness, anxiety, and guilt. It can lead to a form of emotional crisis. They think this is an educational mandate. This is what the point of education is. And then he says, once in a crisis, students can go in many directions. Some that may lead to anti-oppressive change, others that may lead to a more entrenched resistance. Therefore, educators have a responsibility not only to draw students into a possible crisis, but also to structure experiences that can help them work through their crises productively. Let's just pause for a second. Educators have a responsibility to draw students into possible crisis. That's a real sentence. And then they also are meant to structure the environment and experiences around the student to get them to go in a particular direction. That's cult indoctrination. It's knowingly, willfully, and deliberately cult indoctrination. But other scholars in the same domains confirm this for us. There's another paper from 2019, two scholars, Torres and Ferry. They say it explicitly. In a paper called Not Everyone Gets a Seat at the Table, they say it explicitly uh, that this is what their model of education represents, that it's in, and I mean it, that it's indoctrination. Here's how they said it. For all the criticism teachers receive for, quote, indoctrinating students, turning them into liberal-minded crybabies, not much has been said in defense. At the very least, a shy denial is made. It is time for educators to own this criticism and admit that is exactly what we do. 
There it is in black and white. It's on page 33. If not everyone gets a seat at the table, you can read these quotes in uh, The Queering of the American Child, where Logan Lansing uh, put them. He found these, these quotes, actually. I did not. But what Kevin Kumashiro is describing is actually worse than the indoctrination that Torres and Ferry are talking about, saying that that's exactly what they do. A cycle of inducing crisis and then resolving it toward a particular doctrine isn't indoctrination. It's trauma bonding. That's a practice of ideological transformation or thought reform or brainwashing or cult grooming. So it can be pretty plainly said, queer theory practices thought reform, and it practices thought reform because queer theory is the doctrine of a religious cult. We already see that that cult is based on sex and that it primarily targets children and that it has little or nothing to do with with being gay. So that pretty much lays out my primary thesis. That's what queer theory is. Now, of course, fine, it's a cult. What now? Well, nobody joins a cult to join a cult. So you want to have in mind that the people in it don't know it's a cult. And in fact, they may not even know that they are subscribed to queer theory or that queer theory is a critical constructivist ideology of sex, gender, and sexuality. They probably don't know those things, as a matter of fact. But people don't, the point is, people don't join a cult to go find a cult and join it. Nobody says in the morning, hey, I'm going to get up and go find a cult and join a cult because I don't have anything better to do. People join a cult because they are suffering in some way and the cult comes in parasitically and offers them some false resolution to their suffering. It seems like something that will get them out of loneliness, out of spiritual malaise, out of vulnerability of some kind. Virtually everyone who has ever escaped a cult tells this same story. They wanted to belong. They wanted a social circle. They wanted understanding. They wanted purpose in life. They wanted something to do. The cult preys upon these people and slowly locks them in. One of the tools they use is trauma bonding. One of the tools they use is separating people from their their family and friends. What's trauma bonding, though? That sounds bad. Besides what Kevin Kumashiro says is the point of queer education or education for social justice, trauma bonding is as harmful and manipulative as it sounds. It is the technique of cult initiation, I should say, and abuse. It's basically like hazing. The basic formula is really simple. First, you traumatize your targets until you've harmed them enough for the process to work, and then you celebrate them when you do it, when they do what you want, and you don't celebrate them or even punish them more when they do what you don't want. That's it. They will bond with the people traumatizing them because of the rewards they get when the trauma is, the traumatic experience is, is lightened up. This is what Robert Lifton in uh, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism refers to as an alternating cycle of uh, harshness and, and leniency. And that's key to how cult bonding works or thought reform works, as a matter of fact, which is basically the same thing. So in queer theory, what you do is you take people, particularly kids, and you tell them the world isn't at all the way that it seems. And in fact, neither are they. And it isn't the way that they've been led to believe If they're different, it's because they're oppressed. If they feel uncomfortable, it's because society doesn't like people like them. They're probably different than they've always been told. Maybe they've been lied to about themselves. They've certainly been lied to about other people and how society should be. And it's been holding them back and making them feel bad. And maybe instead it's, well, maybe you're not in that category, but the way you act hurts other people. You're hurting people. That's what Kevin Kumashiro actually said. Now, if you're interested in exploring further... Even though you're young, you should. You should explore these feelings, these guilt, anxiety, anger, sadness. Weren't those the ones he talked about? Discomfort with your body, discomfort with your sexuality, discomfort with your social environment, discomfort with your parents. If you're uncomfortable with any of this for any reason, maybe your body is wrong. Maybe your family is wrong. Maybe there's somebody else who you, who is who you really are that you don't know about. And society just doesn't want you to be who they, that person is. Your parents don't want you to be that person either. And if their parent, if your parents disagree, maybe they're going to disagree. Maybe they shouldn't be included in these decisions. Maybe you need to trust a trusted adult instead. Maybe you need um, a school counselor. Maybe you need the, the, the faculty member in charge of the Gay Straight Alliance. Maybe you need a teacher who has the flag up that represents that they're a safe space and that they won't tell on you. Maybe you need a queer family. Queer theory is then offered as the lens that resolves all the resulting confusion, shock, dissonance, pain, guilt, anxiety, sadness, anger, and vulnerability. That's how this works. 
And then what happens next is that you affirm and celebrate them when they show interest. If they get interested in this, think, oh yeah, maybe that's right. Maybe I am different. Maybe there, maybe society's not free. Maybe my parents wouldn't like me thinking this or doing this. Maybe I was made wrong. Maybe I'm in the wrong body. Maybe I'm in the wrong family. Then you celebrate them. You lead them to believe that they're making brave decisions that are worthy of interest and respect. You coerce them and their social groups to participate in this ritual of affirmation and tacitly threaten anyone who doesn't want to go along with it. Or maybe not even tacitly. Maybe you talk about how not inclusive they are and how they're part of the problem and how they're hurting people's feelings. You make the people who are taking the path feel like they belong and that they, just for being who they are, are special and have a special purpose in the world to fulfill, to change the world, to transform the world, to make it more accepting of people like them who don't get to feel that way, or others that they know, their friends. You teach them special words that describe the very small but growing number of people who identify, just like they do, outside of the norm, outside of what society and their parents consider legitimate. This is the trauma bonding process of queer theory, in particular in schools. This is also called programming or grooming, and it takes predictable paths. The first thing it does is it leads people into emotional vulnerability. That's what Kevin Kumashiro said. What I just described, by the way, was lead them into emotional crisis and then structure their experiences so they resolve those crises in the direction you want them to go in. That's all I described. But it leads people into these emo- this emotional vulnerability and into a kind of a a path is offered to resolution. And that generates personal and social interest, which is followed up by psychological and social commitment. They don't want to let the people down that they've so far impressed. They want to keep feeling brave and unique and different and special. So they get a psychological commitment, but also a social commitment. These people have invested in them. These people care about them. These people are supporting them and affirming them in their journeys. And you're going to let them down if you just bail out and think maybe it's not for you. This is then deepened into an increasingly deep social and emotional commitment to the cult that's achieved largely through repeated cycles of trauma bonding techniques. That's how they do this. That's what it means to lead people into crisis and structure their environment so that the crisis resolves in the desired direction. This process creates emotionally and socially bonded members who populate the wide majority of any cult membership. Those who are socially and emotionally locked in without necessarily understanding the doctrine. They don't have to know a word of queer theory. They don't have to know queer theory exists. They don't have to know anything. All they have to do is feel like they belong in the cult and feel like they don't belong in the world anymore. They don't need anything more than that. I've called this in the past, talking about the structure of cults, the outer school of the cult. The social, psychological, and emotional cues are then steadily deepened over time through processes of increasing exposure to doctrine, by processes of increasing exposure to trauma bonding, by having them facilitate the same process on someone else who's newer in the path so that they get more and more committed to it. The feelings, the themes increasingly focus on guilt, shame, isolation, alienation, confusion, at least on the one hand. But meanwhile, they're also talking about a horizon of potentiality. In other words, hope, excitement, inclusion, belonging on the other. Shunning people who act like haters, that's why it's called anti-LGBTQ hate to disagree with them, shunning haters who don't support and affirm them, even if it's their own families, is also increased over time to make sure the cult environment is the predominant influence in the victim's lives. That's what structuring the environment looks like as this process is repeated. This is brainwashing. It is thought reform. It is not education. In fact, it's child abuse, and it's happening at scale by demand in virtually every school system in the United States and in Canada, where it's actually worse. What happens when these kids get committed enough to the cult, when their emotional and social connection is so deep that they're, that's who they are now, that's who they know themselves to be in, a terms, in terms of what's called psychosocial valuation? Well, when the commitment is high enough, a process of study begins. That's when they're going to get introduced to the actual doctrine. The more committed 
outer school members will start to learn the doctrine of the cult. Here, they'd be studying queer theory. In Mao's prisons, they would be studying Marxism and Leninism and socialism. They're not just learning how to use pronouns or discover new ones. They're not learning how to present themselves, how to denounce everything against queer theory, how to shut people out of their lives for disagreeing what the cult thinks is good, for supporting people who are going through this process, affirming blah, 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 cancel what's what's against them and affirm what is for them. They're not just doing that. They're also learning to defend that with pseudo-intellectual arguments based in queer theory. They're learning to do a lot of queer activism, which deepens their commitment. Every time you act on behalf of a set of beliefs, you become more committed to those beliefs. Every time you act in uh, commitment to a group, you become more committed to the group. Why would you be doing any of this stuff, which is unpopular and difficult? It might even involve scary stuff like surgeries or standing up to your parents or throwing your parents under the bus when you could be doing other things, better things, easier things unless you are really committed. That's the psychology here. And these people who are socially and emotionally dependent on a cult that has groomed them to be that way are then led to become intellectually committed to it. And they form not an outer school of the cult, but an inner school. They are what we might call adepts, not initiates. Most of the scholars... The community organizers and the queer theory cult are in this tier. Most of the teachers that visit this upon kids, by the way, are not. They're caught up in the outer school themselves. They don't know the doctrine. They don't. They may not even like it. They're just stuck having to do it or going along with a current or they're just caught up by empathy, which is, we already heard a lie, to push it on to people just in case. The activists, the consultants, they definitely are. The scholars, they definitely are. They know what they're doing. There's another tier beyond this, of course, the so-called inner circle to cults. Members of the inner circle of a cult direct the cult and profit from the cult. They might or might not believe in its doctrine, depending on their motivations. With queer theory, undoubtedly some of the biggest organizers and financiers of the movement, which primarily targets their children, do not believe in it itself, but fully believe in its destructive and disruptive potential on our society and our kids. Others do believe in the enormous amount of profit that's available from destroying lives and turning them into a permanent, complicated medical or psychiatric patient. Others see political utility. I don't think it's likely that much of the Biden administration really believes queer theory, but they see it as a political tool. And they also see its capacity to build a permanently disaffected group with partially legitimate demands that they will make for the rest of their lives against a system they hate that they can then pander to. Others see getting millions of people to participate in the cult and its affirmations as a way to affirm themselves in their own journeys. Think of the kind of big trans billionaires, Martine Rothblatt, the Pritzkers, and so on. They shovel money into it so lots of kids will become trans so that society accepts trans so that society accepts them and that they were a trailblazer who made it happen. That's their journey, and it has to be affirmed. So then they just happen to have billions of dollars to finance campaigns for mass affirmation. There are lots of reasons why people at that tier of the cult might be involved, and it's not always that they fully believe in it, though it can sometimes be that. Um... The most important thing to remember about these different tiers of cults and the the basic structure of cults uh, and the guiding principles behind each is just that they exist. That's the most important thing to realize. The outer school are initiates. They're seeking uh, psychological and social reward through the cult's manipulative offerings. They're overwhelmingly the majority of the captured cultists. The inner school seeks the same thing, but more. They have existential fervor tied to it in some degree that increases over time of intellectual and moral superiority because they know the doctrine. The inner circle may or may not even know the doctrine. They usually do, but they don't always. It tends to be small in number and is ultimately using the whole cult to whatever its twisted purposes are, which may not agree with one another in a case like this. In the case of Marxist cults, the inner circle always uses the revolutionary cult of the era and then disposes of it when it's time to move on to the next phase of the revolution. And I don't think that we should see anything different. I think that these destabilizers that we see in queer activism are likely to be disposed of when they become a liability if the revolution succeeds. But they're really useful for tearing apart the society we have now um, by tearing apart families and children's lives and so much else. 
So a little more on the environment about cults, though, because I think it's important to understand the environment in which cults transform their victims needs to be kind of looked at, and nobody has done it in greater depth than Robert Lifton, Robert J. Lifton, who studied the Maoist cult in detail as it was happening in the 1950s. Um, and he asserts that cults effectively take advantage of up to eight qualities that allows them to do thought reform on their populations. Um, queer theory, as you'll see, very obviously use, utilizes all eight of these and does so in sophisticated ways. And so I'll talk about each one of these eight very briefly. Um, first, there's milieu control. Cults control the environment and make sure it only reflects cult doctrine. This is why they cut people off from their friends or families. Uh, any outside information and views, that's all problematic. It's harmful. It's hurtful. It's hate. You can't look at it. Don't listen to James Lindsay's podcast. He's a hater. He's LGBTQ hate. It's just going to hurt your feelings. It's so much transphobia. You won't be able to stand it. They keep you isolated in your milieu from anything that might challenge or, or break you free of cult doctrine. So, by the way, if you happen to be imbibed in queer theory or you're kind of a queer theorist or you think you have a queer identity and you happen to be listening to this, you're in a fucking cult. I'm just let me tell you just bluntly. I use the bad word not because I lack words, not because I'm missing vocabulary, but to get your attention. You are in a fucking cult. And you are gonna. You need to wake up. It will. Your life will get better from the day you start getting away from this. But anyway, the milieu control is all about like in our our world. What we see is that it's using inclusion policies to ensure institutions and people only present cult agreeable views and affirmation, and they remove anything that might cause doubt to the cult, including people, materials, and so on, aka cancel culture. Um, it is the immersive media and messaging that we get from all levels, entertainment, school, the po politicians, everything. Once you have milieu control, second, Lifton says that you can then engage in something he calls mystical manipulation. And I did a short bullet point uh, episode of the podcast recently about that um, called planned spontaneity, the lie of planned spontaneity. Cults, he says, create an appearance of total agreement mostly by silencing all disagreement, and a sense of inevitability. You might hear it kind of phrased this way. There's a change coming, and there's nothing you can do about it, but you want to get on the right side of it because things will be good for you. You might also hear it as who's on the right side of history. There's a sense of total agreement. All of society is going this way. In inevitability, history is moving this way. There's also planned spontaneity, which is organized protests and activism and activities that are made to look like they were spontaneous and organic because it gives the impression that the people are motivated to bring this into being. And it also gives a sense of higher purpose, like being on the right side of history. And the point of mystical manipulation by a cult is in order to convince the victims of their power and influence, the inevitability, the to to total agreement of society. It's just happening. Look, there's so many people involved, and they're working toward a better future. It makes the cult appear more right and righteous to those captured by its spells. Think of the film The Truman Show. Jim, character, Jim Carrey's character, Truman, was at the center of a huge operation of mystical manipulation, if you want to understand what that looks like. Um, that was a totally controlled milieu. Third, Lifton says that within cult environments, there is a demand for purity. Actually, he says within ideological totalist environments, which is to say cult environments, there's a demand for purity. Cults are virtually always puritanical in their value systems. They present their victims with stark contrasts of good and evil, of right and wrong, on virtually every issue, and they demand purity with being on the right side of every issue. And in fact, they leverage that because you can't be. You can't be perfectly pure. So you keep this constant wheel of shame turning inside of you of guilt and shame, and then you use that to pressure other people into better compliance to cover up for your failures so that it's not you getting called out, it's them instead first. These dynamics manifest in dichotomies like pure versus impure, absolutely good versus absolutely evil, sacred versus profane, or specifically in social justice cults like queer theory, affirmation versus existential denial, or care versus hate. They're also interested in and cults are, if not obsessed with the binary of queer theory in particular, with the binary of innocence versus initiation to various levels of standing within the cult, including inclusion within the cult itself. In the extreme, this demand for purity sets up a dichotomy as stark as the people versus the enemies of the people. The people support queer theory, 
the enemies of the people are anti-LGBTQ hate who must be destroyed in the name of the queer people. Fourth, he lists or he, he mentions what he calls a cult of confession that's based off of the demand for purity. The demand for purity leads the cult's victims to readily identify how they fall short of cult perfection, leading them to both fear and desire to confess their failures and their evil ways. That's the whole program. Confess. Recognize your crimes. You have to confess. Look at the three-body problem scene. Look at these other scenes of the cultural revolution that keep going viral now that people can kind of open their eyes and see what's happening. That's what it's about, a cult of confession. Confess how you were transphobic. Confess how you contributed to homophobia. Confess how you could do better. Cults often encourage this behavior to facilitate the trauma bonding process, but they also do it to get you to recognize cult doctrine and its application to your own life and situation, uh, what Paulo Freire calls your own existential situation. The trauma bonding wheel of pain gets turned through pressuring people to confess, say, to homophobia or transphobia, being a made-up gender, a made-up sexuality or whatever, and then rewarding them what they do and punishing those that get accused of, uh, you know, not being on board. Only later, after they, they say, you know, they, after they do what they're supposed to do, later, you th- it's a wheel of pain, as I said, you later indicate that their confession wasn't sufficient or sincere enough, and you pull up some little detail where they fell short to point out that they didn't really mean it, they're not really on board, they still have internalized transphobia or whatever to initiate another round of struggle. The milieu control and demand for purity come together to create a uniquely exquisite psychological environment. Lifton's very clear about this. In this environment, almost everyone believes everyone else is pure while they themselves are not. By the way, if you search, I actually did do a podcast about this chapter of Lifton specifically where I read, I think, the whole thing, if not very close to it. So you can go listen to Lifton's full exposition on this Um on New Discourses and another podcast. I'll think of the title sooner or later. Um, but if you search, go to the search bar and type in Lifton, you can figure out which podcast is Lifton's. Uh, and I read the entire chapter of, of his book for, for this topic. But anyway, sorry, this I was talking about the unique psychological environment, an exquisite psychological environment created by Malou control and demand for purity. So you're in a completely controlled environment and your purity demands are high and you're being manipulated all the time mystical manipulation. And what it results in is that almost everyone believes that everyone else is pure while they themselves are not. Think about that. Everyone you look around at is somehow a saint because everybody else got canceled and thrown out, by the way. Everyone else is a saint of the ideology, but you, nobody will tell how they are secretly transphobic. Nobody will come up. It's like the time I had this young woman come up to me and uh, the friend of the family and uh, she came up and asked if she could talk to me because she knows my stance on these things. And she said, I want to talk to you because I know I can, can tell you this. And I have something I have to say. And I was like, what is it? And she said, I'm just done with the pronoun thing. And she started crying because she didn't have anybody she could tell she was done with the pronoun thing. She thought the pronoun thing was ridiculous. So she knew she had this inner sin against the trans doctrine or the co- the queer theory doctrine that the pronoun rituals ridiculous and it's just demanding and it's compelled speech, but she didn't feel like she could tell anybody that. So she thought she alone among her, she came to me to tell me because she thought she alone, alone in the world, completely isolated, felt that way. And she had to find some forbidden outsider to tell it to. So the feeling is that you're the only one falling short, even though sometimes you see your so-called classmates confessing to their own failures. And then at that point, you're like, well, at least it's not me. And you join in the denouncing of them, motivated by your own sense of hidden shame. Because you are led to feel like you are alone and that you alone have the deepest, darkest failures against the cult doctrine, which is impossible. And the guilt and shame are so overwhelming that they fuel even more accusation and criticism and confession, which is self-criticism, just by virtue of how they make you feel. And that is the part of the environment, the cult environment, that does the bulk of the indoctrination or brainwashing or thought reform work. What is it brainwashing you into? Well, fifth, Lifton describes what he calls that all cults have at the center, or all ideological totalist environments have at the center, a sacred science. So at the heart of every cult is what Lifton refers to as a sacred science that is infallible. People can and do fail it all the time, but the doctrine itself cannot fail. 
You've probably heard that before. It's it, in this case, it would be queer theory cannot fail, but people can fail queer theory. And people are being brainwashed into that sacred science. The point of the cult of confession is to create a dynamic that forces people to confess their failure to understand, internalize, and act, and even embody the sacred science. The point of Kevin Kumashiro is leading people into emotional crisis and structuring the environment around them so they resolve it productively is to lead them to internalize and act and even embody the sacred science all while accusing others of their failings as much and often as possible in the name of helping them in the same way. The point of the confession is to get people to willingly adopt the lens of the sacred science, in this case queer theory, so that they can learn to, quote, recognize their crimes against the sacred science and the society, aka cult that supports it, and to pledge to do better. Pledging to do better means ideologically remolding yourself to use Mao's words for it. And here, queer theory is given as the sacred science, the one true correct understanding of sex, gender, sexuality, and all the normal features of society and its definitions of what is and is not legitimate. It is more than we're going to cover today, but it's a critical constructivist ideology of sex, gender, and sexuality, which believes that sex, gender, and sexuality are ultimately socially constructed phenomena that are the products of dominant power that um, imprison people in a life that is uh, structured by the power dynamics of society, and it is their obligation to wake up to that fact and to denounce all norms and legitimacy in order to try to overthrow that system. Sixth, Lifton calls it doctrine over person. Cults place doctrine over people. If we quote from Hegel, as I like to do at times like this, history uses people and then discards them. Um, the person isn't even a person in the eyes of the cult if they don't hold to and enact the doctrine. As Mao said, not to have correct political opinions is like not having a soul. Uh, I don't really need to elaborate, though, on how doctrine operates over people. You're not really a person, and you can't be associated with unless you are involved in and support the doctrine. Seventh, lift and lo uh, calls it loading the language. Do I have to describe how queer theory loads the language? All the words mean more than one thing. Everything's got an agenda tucked in it. We're all very familiar with the language stuff now. Inclusion, belonging, diversity, hate. This is all heavily loaded language that all advances the acceptance and spread of the agenda of the cult and keeps people locked into it. And eighth, Lifton says the last characteristic of cults is dispensing of existence. And he says at the deepest level, I'm not quoting him here, I'm paraphrasing him, the cult decides whose existence counts and whose doesn't. The punchline of this is that those who accept the cult doctrine, which is the sacred science, and its application are considered people and no one else is. It's like they don't have a soul, is what Mao said. Only the doctrinally legitimate are allowed to exist, at least in a spiritual sense. Everyone else is some kind of a fallen, deplorable hater, effectively enemies and non-people, which justifies their abuse, their disenfranchisement, their silencing, cutting them out of your life, even if they're your parents, and so on. That's a cult environment, and queer theory, as you can see very easily, satisfies all of that. Just kind of for fun, um, the standard Iron Law of Woke Projection, of course, always applies because it never misses, and the dispensing of existence aspect of the cult environments is kind of why woke activists always say everything is denying their existence or a genocide. You know, they always say, oh, you deny our existence unless you give us gender-affirming care. Uh, it's a trans genocide. They're projecting. What's happening is they're projecting. It's the Iron Law of Woke Projection. Their belief is that you don't have a right to exist if your beliefs, quote-unquote, deny their right to exist, which is in quotes because you aren't denying their right to exist. You're denying their political identity, which isn't even a real identity. In queer theory, this means if you don't affirm their po embodied political activism against everything legitimate and normal, then you're denying their existence. It's like how the fat studies people, which took this idea from queer theory, by the way, say that if you were to encourage weight loss programs and fitness and eating better and losing weight, um, 
that what you would do is a fat genocide. Because if all the people lost weight and there are no fat people, there would be no fat culture. And so you've committed a fat genocide by getting rid of all the fat people. And you say, well, we didn't get rid of anybody. And they say, well, there's no fat people. So you got rid of fat people. Um, and you think I'm making it up, but that's how they think. And um, because you are apparently willing to do a genocide of that kind or a cultural genocide, you're therefore beyond the pale of humanity and do not deserve to exist. That's actually the cult's logic. And that's the logic of all totalitarian genocides. That's it. The people who, you know, we have, we have a communist utopia on the other side. We have a queer horizon of possibility and potentiality. What transphobes and selfish capitalists and so on won't let us have it. So we've got to get rid of them. We would already have communism. Socialism would already be working great. We would already have a communist utopia, but some people are selfish and won't won't give up their private property. So let's just go seize their farms and get the program going. We could open our society back up, you know, if if everybody would just get their vaccines, if everybody would just 100% of everybody just got all their shots, then we could just get our economy back. Same logic. All totalitarian genocides come from this darkest piece of cult logic. We could go a lot deeper into the nature of the queer theory cult and how it's a cult than this. I'm sure I will in future podcasts. I'm not going to drag it out. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole Gnostic hermetic conception of the world with normal society acting like a evil spirit that imprisons everyone into performing a fake persona for the world. That's gender performativity. So they can never be liberated to be who they truly are. I've done that at length in other podcasts. I'll probably do it again. I think there's one actually called Queer Theory is Queer Gnosticism or something. You should go listen to that. You should also read The Queering of the American Child where we cover this in tremendous depth. Um, that would get us into talking about Judith Butler, one of Queer Theory's uh, founding mothers, I suppose, fathers, I mean, whatever, and her belief that gender and sex aren't actually real but are performances. We already talked about that. Um, we learned to repeat those performances in order to satisfy normal society, which is now acting like a Gnostic demiurge. Her whole body of work could be summarized, like I said before, in the six words, drag is life and life is drag. So everybody's always doing drag and everything that they do, whether they realize it or not, because society writes the scripts for how we do drag, which is usually cis hetero. Um, and that we just do that. And in her language, borrowing from Foucault, she says that imprisons their souls which they then have to script physically on, that's her word, script them physically onto their body or inscribe onto their body and script into the society through their bodies by performing gender and becoming aware of this doingness of gender. Maybe one day I'll read doing gender as a podcast, as a paper that gets is super influential, that gets overlooked a lot. Um, but being coming for Judith Butler, becoming aware of the doingness of gender and even sex and sexuality opens the door to that queer horizon of possibilities beyond the norm. Um, she got those ideas in turn from Michel Foucault. Uh, we already talked about him. Uh, also from uh, the radical feminism she was embedded in, which would be Simone de Beauvoir. Um, we could get really deep into that. We've kind of done it before. Uh, what do I want to say here? Um, the idea, though, is that, you know, society forces you to imprison yourself uh, in a gender performance or a mode of presentation and that you can break free of that prison by understanding it. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole John Money side of things and Stoller and Greenson and the idea of gender identity. That's a, another podcast for another day, but it, it's basically what they did is kind of discombobulated the idea of who we are by misusing the synonym for sex. That is gender, um, initially likely as a synonym, but then by divorcing it from sex entirely, that's its own story. We're not going to get into the, I mean, I did a podcast on this feminist, something about feminist Gnosticism, you can look it up, where I talk about uh, Simone de Beauvoir and the pressing question of what is a woman. One is not born but becomes woman, she said, and her point was the same as Foucault's about homosexuals. What does it mean to be a woman when no one else, in particular society and patriarchy, get to tell you what it means to be a woman? Uh, or for Foucault, a homosexual, which Halpern says means queer. So in short, we really could summarize this as a reconceptualization of what I call social Gnosticism, in which we are imprisoned by the features of our social reality, but can escape, at least socio-spiritually, with the right hidden insights about who we really are, 
and into what world we have been flung or thrown. That's a Heidegger reference if you don't know it. And that um, by doing so that we might actually achieve liberation or emancipation. That's why their language is this way. Um, this is a transformative social Gnosticism that reconceives of the uh, mysticism of earlier ages. Um, it's a lot to get into about how characters such as Rousseau and Hegel and Marx uh, preceding Beauvoir, Foucault and Butler, or even Swedenborg and uh, Jakob Boma and uh, some of these other characters, maybe Vico, uh, Giambattista Vico, and some others all led to this um, social alchemy, as described, by the way, and you should listen to my George Soros podcast about social alchemy. Uh, but with queer theory and queer education in particular and social justice education more broadly, one of its primary laboratories for this mysticism is our children. And we should be really upset, but we also should ask the question, why children? Why does queer theory target kids? Why is it so interested in children, which is one of the characteristics that I gave. Remember, I said queer theory is the doctrine of a religious cult. That cult is based on sex. It is little or nothing to do with gay people, and it primarily targets children. Well, four reasons, really. First, children are in schools, typically, and even with their entertainment, uh, they are a captive envir uh, captive audience in schools. They have to go to school for 30, 35 hours a week, even if unless they're very strictly monitored in homeschooling. Their curriculum standards are usually including this. And so they're a captive audience. Second, children have not achieved the necessary cortical development in their brains to distinguish reality from fantasy. So the mystifications of queer theory can be considered plausible to them where adults would be less interested. Third, children are going through the developmental process uh, processes, I should say, of identity formation and puberty, which need to be hijacked for this ideology to take firm root. Just... It's so tumultuous to grow up, but you are also literally going through the process of figuring out who you are, which is a whole thing. And they have to take advantage of that in order to get queer theory to really take root. But finally, children become, and this is really important from the Marxist perspective, that queer theory is queer Marxism. Again, read Queering of the American Child and really get your head around this. It's important. But children become a gateway into families and they become a wedge into not just families, but also other targets, families, faiths, and any institutions they grow up to become a part of. They have to have a bottom-up demand that they're trying to force into our kids through brainwashing them at school to demand the inclusive policies so they can have uh, the ability to install them by what looks like dint of demand rather than totalitarian top-down force. That's how they're trying to get around that. Okay, so now we can summarize. What is queer theory? It's a doctrine of a religious cult. The cult is primarily sex-based. It predominantly targets children and has little to nothing to do with being gay. And what can we do about it? Well, normally we would turn to our institutions and ask them to see the light and step in, but we can't do that. This isn't working. Our institutions are actually captured. Our medical institutions, our educational institutions, our government institutions, our entertainment institutions, our media institutions, they're captured. We face a problem of captured institutions, or as I like to phrase it now, ideologically contaminated institutions. Our institutions accept and promote queer theory all the way up to the White House. We therefore cannot count on our institutions, educational, psychological, medical, governmental, anything to help us here. They're all captured. What do we do? They are part of the controlled milieu in Lifton's language. They are creating the mystical manipulation. They are peddling the sacred science of queer theory. They are in, in short, the center of the problem. So what's this like? Here's an analogy. It's like being a pilot and you're flying the plane and imagine all your instruments go out, right? So you're flying the plane, you're, you're a pilot and everything goes out on the aircraft, right? No navigation computer, no altimeter, nothing. And what do you have to do? That's us. We have, our institutions are like our, our instruments, what do you have to do if you're that pilot? Because this tells us what we're going to do. So imagine, picture yourself in the cockpit. You're flying a plane and all, you're in the air and all of a sudden all your instruments go out. What do you have to do? You have to fly the plane safely, mechanically, and find a runway and land. You don't get to rely on your instruments because you don't have them. Like I said, no navigation computer, no altimeter, no speedometer, nothing. You have you, you have your experience, you have your wits, 
and you're hopefully the weather's good and you have enough ability to see what's in front of you to do the right thing. That's all you get. That's like us. Our institutions are like the instruments in that cockpit, but for society, not for an airplane. And right now they're putting out all the wrong information consistently. They will not help us find a runway or land the plane safely. And if we take the plane analogy seriously, our lives and the lives of everybody in the plane, aka our society, depend on us doing this. So what would we do in that situation? We would use our senses. We would trust our eyes and ears, in other words. We would use our senses directly to look for the runway, to line up, lower the plane, land it, and slow down and stop. We wouldn't be looking to the broken instruments at all. We wouldn't be looking off into space. We would look at reality around us and navigate without the instruments as the intermediary. And that's what we need to start finding ways to do now at the societal level, one individual at a time. We need to start figuring out how to look around us, assess what's really going on, and make smart, judicious action where calamity, if we or if we're rash, if you just jerk the wheel or pull the throttle or whatever, you're still going to crash and everything's going to go bad. We have to make smart decisions that take into account reality. Individually, what does that mean? What do you do? Well, what you start with is the truth, not some mediated truth peddled by these corrupt institutions, but the plain simple truth, the kind that you can see with your eyes and experience and everybody knows, like that there are two sexes, that people can't change sex, that most people are straight, that gay happens. We don't know why. That's fine. Queer is not an identity. It's a defiant political stance. We don't have to tolerate or accommodate. How can you know that one with your own senses? Because it's in the fucking book defining it, guys. It's in black and white. They wrote it down themselves. So if they tell you that, you have that information. So if someone claims to have an identity or sexuality that requires an explanation, to put it simply, it's fake. That's, that's common sense, right? If somebody claims to have an identity or sexuality that requires an explanation, it's fake and doesn't demand our respect. We don't have to respect this. We have to be nice. We, or not nice. We have to be um, human to people. We have to realize that the people in this cult are people in a cult. They need help. They need deprogramming. They need, therefore, patience and compassion and a landing pad and lots of things. But we also have to recognize that there's a lot of predatory behavior happening, and predatory behavior of any kind in any place is not something that we have to support or enable. Perversion outside of the confines, if you want to call it this, of consenting adults acting in private does not deserve our tolerance and shouldn't be given it. Our schools should not be doing any of this. Our schools should not be pushing our kids into emotional crisis and then resolving it productively. That's child abuse. Our schools should not be putting pornography in front of our children, whether it's in class or through their libraries or through the curriculum, through any various tricks. And children do not benefit from its presence there. Enough of this. This is the kind of stuff is that, that you can start to first recognize. Get your bearings. If you're in that plane, you've got to figure out what the heck's going on. You've got to get your bearings for yourself. That's what I'm talking about. Wait a minute. Porn in the schools? What the hell? What? Push kids into an emotional crisis and resolve it according to our doctrine? That's a problem. What are you going to do? You've got to assess what's going on. You've got to stop listening to the, to the gaslighting and the BS and get your head on straight. You've got a plane to land and you don't have instruments. In fact, you have worse than no instruments. You have lying instruments. And with the where that is is in the truth. So you've got to look for the truth. And you really have to look for it and you have to tell other people it. What I say a lot, and you've heard this before, I did a podcast on this, is that you have to love the truth. I kind of riff from the Bible. You have to love the truth with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. And you have to love your neighbor enough to tell your neighbor the truth as you would have him tell you the truth. Um, these are basic commandments. This is, this is, this sound, it sounds like that's not enough. It's everything at the beginning. And then you put that into practice and you can fix the world. Um, but you really do have to love the truth because if you love the truth, you'll say it. You won't care if they call you transphobic. You'll seek it. You'll read these awful books. You'll defend it when you get under attack or somebody else says you'll defend other people who are saying it. You'll support them. You'll back them up. You have to love the truth because if you don't, eventually the SPLC is going to write an article about you and you're going to back off. You'll buckle. They're going to threaten to take something away from you or, or your kids that you can't bear and you'll buckle and you'll get pulled into this caring, affirming nonsense. But the fact of the matter is that there's no caring and there's no affirmation that isn't first built on the truth. So you're going to have to love the truth and you're going to have to 
pr- push it and defend it and help other people do it in tough situations. There's no other way. And every time you tell a lie, just remember this, every time you tell a lie to, to be nice or to fit in, the pronoun game or whatever, you're selling a piece of your soul, so you have to stop doing that. And that's what it means, really, to love the truth. And if you start there, telling the truth, that's what Solzhenitsyn said, is that if you tell the truth, one man telling the truth can bring down a regime. It starts a ripple effect. One person telling the truth is a lot, becomes a lot of people telling the truth. Facts start to come out, and then there's more things to tell. The WPATH files come out. Next thing you know, this entire medical monstrosity starts to crumble out from under. And you say, well, we can't get the law to go along with us. We can't get the courts to agree with us. Keep fighting because day by day by day, something else comes out. Keep digging. Somebody had to go look up what's going on at WPATH, whether it's Mia Hughes or whoever digging into it. Um, There's other revelations, I guess. uh, Do No Harm just released some. The Daily Caller just released some. Somebody's digging into it. So start digging, get curious, ask questions, read the materials, figure out who's funding it, whatever it happens to be, and then report on it. And when you do these things, which is what it means to be based, by the way. You break the milieu control, and you can start to break apart the cult. You also need to protect your kids, obviously, um, to keep them out of the controlled milieu. Uh, and the one that you children are supposed to be in a sheltered milieu, and the parents are in charge of that sheltering. Um, you also, when you do these things, you tell the truth, you seek the truth, you fight for the truth, you defend the truth every day. You don't just break milieu control. You bl- you break apart mystical manipulation. They can't trick you. If they end up doing this huge stage demonstra- demonstration and you say that's planned spontaneity and it's fake, it makes it lose its magical power. You, by doing this, cast doubt upon the so-called sacred science. Gender ideology starts looking not just even incorrect, but ridiculous. And the more people who think it's ridiculous, the more people who will either loudly or quietly walk away from it. What happens when you start doing this and start doing it consistently and start doing it every day, like Billboard Chris showing up one conversation at a time, getting clear on his pursuing the information, getting clear, getting out there and talking to people as you start to break those cycles of abuse, you break the cult of confession, you tell people that it's okay to trust their eyes and their ears and even their gut intuition and to believe in common sense again. And to understand, therefore, very clearly that what they are experiencing and seeing in queer theory is abusive and manipulative. Because queer theory is the doctrine, as I said, of a cult religion that is based on sex that primarily targets their children, has very little to do, nothing to do really, with being gay. It's hostile, in fact, to gay interests in every regard, if we can, might use the phrase gay interests. And so it's our necessary responsibility to learn as much about it as we can, both in theory and in practice, and to tell people about it and oppose it. Um, Like I said, you can read a lot of what I had to say here in my book with Logan Lansing. It's his book, really, that I helped with called The Queering of the American Child. Um, I hope this was an informative episode. It was a lot longer than I meant. Um, I gave this talk at Pitt in like 45 minutes, and here we are at almost an hour and 40, but uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, More to come soon. I've got more horrifying UN documents and other things coming. So thank you for listening and I'll catch you in the next one.